So, hi everyone, it's Nick Maley here. Uh, it's another Cinema Sunday, and I'm broadcasting uh, directly from the Folly Star Foundation's Yodagai movie uh, exhibit here in St. Martin. You know, this is the latest of a series of uh, webcasts that we do to try and keep uh, the foundation afloat through the this economic crisis and if you want to support us or if you want to see uh, these panels when they're live you know every uh, every month we do two live shows uh, with uh, four or eight hours of uh, live panels and you get to watch those um, uh, premieres of those if you uh, uh, have joined our Patreon group. It, it's not an expensive thing. It can be five dollars a month or, or or more if you want. But today uh, we're going to be talking about uh, the Freeborn legacy. My old boss Stu Freeborn and his son Graham, who's an unsung hero of the uh, Star Wars uh, classic trilogy. And you can see behind the. Um, the the bronze bust that i did of Stu's yoda sculpt that's uh, i've been rebuilding from uh, relics so uh, with you know little more ado let's um, you know let's move on with that <laughs> So I'm going to be doing a panel here about my uh, my, my old boss, um, Stu Freeborn, about the Freeborn family in many ways. You know, this is um, something I, I think when often I'm, I'm talking about um, Stuart or I'm talking about these movies, I talk about uh, different people that were involved in doing different things. We don't, uh, we can't ever uh, downplay the contribution and the effort that uh, Stuart, um, you know, put into that. But, you know, so often when people are talking about Stuart, they all talk about Star Wars. They all talk about, uh, you know, the the, the innovation uh, that came from that. And so often the rest of his career um, gets ignored. And so I want to try and give you a background, an understanding of where Stuart came from, how he, um, his his personal struggle to um, to make um, movie history and the legacy that the Freeborns really added to um, to the, the, the development of uh, modern prosthetics and animatronics um, in England. You know, uh, Stuart was um, a you know a, a a mainstream guy long before uh, we ever got to Star Wars. You'll see that he was born on the fifth of September, nineteen fourteen. Uh, he died February uh, 2013. He was literally uh, 98 years old and had contributed to seven decades of uh, movie making. You know, as an amateur, he started out uh, doing makeups uh, and effects on himself. You know, he would have been, uh, you know, in his uh, late teens, early 20s when he was doing this. And he would take photographs of himself uh, in these different characters. I guess, you know, this in its own way was a new, was, was a, a, an early form of cosplay um, to an amateur, you know, to, to dress up as characters. And uh, he would have been um, influenced by uh, horror characters from silent movies and, and various. Uh, you know, various other things. He um, he sent the photos that he made to the leading makeup artists in the UK of the day. Um, you know, I often talk about the uh, the difficulties of uh, getting, uh, of moving forward in any of these uh, things. And people who have been, who seem like uh, icons in the field, you forget that they started out just like everybody else, struggling to, to try and be noticed. Stuart had taken these photos. He sent them to the movie studios. And just like me, uh, trying to get into movies all those years later, he didn't get an answer. No one bothered to, uh, to respond to it. Uh, and um, so he came up with another radical plan. 
um, or any, you know, there were there were reports that started to show up in 1935 in the London Times magazine that said that Emperor Haile Selassie had been seen driving a car in Kent. And there were questions over exactly how um, a, a international dignitary could be in England without uh, people knowing that he was there. And it was Stuart. You know, he'd made a fake nose and a beard and he'd done a makeup and he was driving around basically to draw attention to his his work, to what it was he was doing. And he did draw attention. Um, the police detained him for questioning. Uh, they wanted to know why he was impersonating a uh, a, a, you know, a foreign dignitary. And um, and that really um, was looked like that was going to be, you know, the end of the story. But um, he, again, didn't give up. He sent uh, newspaper clippings and photos, uh, not to the makeup department this time, but to Alexander Corder. Alexander Corder was a, 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 you know, a legendary filmmaker in the 30s who uh, had control of Denim Film Studios. Uh, this is a photograph of those studios. These studios, I, I was there years later, and uh, they were really not um, as developed as you as you see here. But um, in its day, it, you know, it was a it was a big deal. And so he got a message telling him to come to the studio. So he went to the studio, and he was asked to reproduce one of the makeups that he had done. And so he 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 sat down, he did the makeup on himself. Uh, when it was finished, someone came in and they led him down to the soundstage. The first time that he'd ever actually stepped onto a film studio floor. And it was uh, for the making of the movie um, Rembrandt uh, with Charles Lawton. And suddenly there he was in the height of uh, you know, of these things. And this makeup that you see on Charles Lawton, which presumably was done by the head of the makeup department, is nothing like as uh, extensive as the, the makeups that Stuart was doing. And he said to me, he, he realized that the reason that no one was replying to him was because his work was already better than the people who were actually doing the job. And, and whether that's true or not, I can't really say, but he would laugh uh, when he when he told that story. And he went on to contribute to a lot of uh, different movies in the day. This was the first movie where he did his own, uh, you know, where we had an on-screen uh, makeup. Um, it starred uh, Annabella, a movie called Wings of the Morning. It was 1936. Yes, they did have stars that went by one name. Madonna didn't invent it. Um, Annabella was a French actress that, uh, that everybody knew just by that, by that one name. Um, he, you know, for 10 years, he contributed to lots of different movies, largely um, not credited at all. And uh, th that's something that really stuck with him. And I, I, you'll understand more later on when I'm talking about it. But you have to realize that in those days, only the heads of department got credits on, on movies. And so... Uh, he was doing movies, you know, on, he was doing movies like The Thief of Baghdad, uh, classic, classic movie, Victoria the Great, where he was doing uh, aging makeups and various other things um, without any credit at all. Um, we're, we're coming into the 40s now, and um, Stu and his wife Kay um, produced three children. So the, the first, um, Roger, was born prematurely in a... Um, you know, during the Blitz, and um, it was something that um, that really riled Stu. He 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 felt very angry about uh, about that situation. His uh, his second son uh, Raymond um, was a very smart uh, guy that um, became a very respected location manager and production manager, and uh, started producing movies in the late nineties. Um, uh, of course, Kay. Um, when they needed extra people, rather than letting in strangers, they, they brought in, the, the makeup artists brought in their own family members, and Kay became a makeup artist, I think, in, somewhere in the 50s or the 60s. Um, their third son, Graham, uh, was my very close friend, and he um, was a very, very gifted uh, makeup effects artist that I'm going to tell you a lot about towards the end of this um, of this presentation. And Graham's son, daughter Michelle um, also got into making movies and I think worked with Weta in uh, New Zealand last time I heard. 
So Stewart's first film credit was for Green for Danger. And um, it, he, uh, you know, now he was the head of department, uh, but it wasn't really until 1948 that he suddenly rose to international notoriety with the David Lean version of Oliver Twist. And this really is at the heart of, um, of really where his reputation started to come from because you know he was a makeup artist as well as a makeup effects artist i think you can see from this photograph that this uh this makeup which is on alec guinness uh, really doesn't look like alec guinness at all it's a it's progressed from the photos that he did on himself as an amateur it's a very believable um particularly when properly lit a very believable uh, makeup and uh, you know you can see where it progresses literally from a young uh, alec guinness um, this huge nose that he put on uh, he put on the character, which Stuart told me wasn't something that he wanted to do, but the studio had um, had wanted uh, almost a, a cartoon character. Um, you know, lots of loose hair, uh, loose laid hair, um, so that would be applied one hair at a time. The eyebrows, the the, the change to the hairline. Um, you can see this publicity shot of Stuart looking very unStuart like. Um, on the right there, and, and, but unfortunately, this uh, makeup um, and the and the portrayal generally um, was considered to be anti-Semitic, and uh, so it drew a lot of attention that the movie had never intended. The studios had a cartoon of Fagin uh, from illustrations that came uh, with the book, and so they had they had wanted to reproduce that, uh, but it was considered. Um, Kind of defamatory, and in New York, uh, which had a, a very uh, big um, Jewish uh, congregation there, um, it was denounced, and the film wasn't even screened there uh, for two years. Remember that this is a time when Stu was not working with foam latex. There were no silicon transfers. It was before all the modern prosthetics that we talked about. These are uh, sculpted pieces made in slush latex. Um, so they would be hollow and they would be, you know, applied, uh, the eye bags, the uh, various parts would be done in the most primitive form. And it's a real testament to his, um, his prowess as a, as a, a character makeup artist. He went on uh, through uh, to do a number of other films, often doing three or four films a year, like uh, Disney's story of Robin Hood and uh, The Dam Busters. The Dam Busters was a movie I kind of grew up on um, about, uh, uh, you know, about the, uh, the efforts to blow up a, a, a dam during the war. Um, in 1954, um, there was this movie called His Majesty O'Keefe, and it was made in England, but it starred Burt Lancaster. Uh, Burt Lancaster was a huge star by that time, and he came to England thinking that he was going to be working with a bunch of second-rate uh, technicians. And so he presented Stuart with a whole series of drawings that had been done by Bud Westmore. The Westmores were a real family of uh, makeup artists in Hollywood, and proudly pronounced to Stuart, well, this is how we do it in Hollywood. Well, Stuart was a very feisty little guy. I mean, he was short, but he was like a little bulldog. And he wasn't going to, uh, he wasn't going to take that um, from, from anyone. And so he pulled out his own drawings and said, yeah, well, this is how we're going to do it in England. And he, he, he ended up being very good friends um, with Bert uh, and, and, um, and impressed him with, with his own talent. One of the major uh, movies, again, also with Alec Guinness, um, was uh, The Bridge Over the River Kwai. And The Bridge Over the River Kwai was a massive film in its, uh, in its day. It was, uh, a, a, a month ago, we had Peter Beale on, um, and I believe Peter, this was one of the, the things that uh, Peter was involved in, Lawrence of Arabia and, and other movies. But um, the break over the River Kwai, though, nearly ended um, Stewart's career because uh, while they were driving back from location at the end of the day, um, the car that he was in was struck by a truck and everybody in the car except for Stewart um, died. He was flung out through the, the, the top of the car um, 15 feet into the jungle. And when they came and took away the bodies, they didn't even know he was there. And he lay in the, he could hear them, he told me. And he lay in the jungle for 15 hours before someone realized that there were four people in the car, not three. 
and went back and found him. And he spent four months in the hospital um, recovering from that. One of the uh, movies that uh, really, again, um, gave Stuart a chance to show his uh, prowess was Stanley Kubrick's uh, Doctor Strange Love, this very black comedy about uh, blowing up the world. And uh, it, it was a movie that where um, he was able to, um, you know, turn Peter Sellers into um, four different characters, the president and a, a, a pilot and, and uh, the, the classic Doctor Strange Love. And he was um, extraordinary in, um, in, you know, being able to pull together because Peter Sellers was a personality in himself and uh, often wanted, you know, himself to, you know, not to be completely um, covered. But this started a relationship with uh, Peter that uh, went on for, for many years. So we come to 2001 A Space Odyssey and this is a, such a landmark in, uh, in movie history and in the history of animatronics because this was a hugely influential film. Uh, it, it was a, a controversial film because a lot of people didn't really understand it. It was a film that uh, had um, ape suits that were, um, that were miles ahead of anything that had been done before. And he took Stuart from the, from the realm of a person who was a, a character makeup artist into the really the beginnings of animatronics uh, and creature suits as we understand them today this is 1968 and uh, you know this has within it a lot of technology that is um is similar to star wars uh, things that a lot of the crew that came from this movie were taken on uh, to star wars uh, later on um stewart's ape suits uh, although they may look quite primitive to our eye now at that point in time um were the most sophisticated ape suits that had uh, ever been seen. But the uh, the Dawn of Man sequence didn't start out that way. It started out with the idea that they would be some kind of Neanderthal. Um, and so they ran these tests um, for uh, for that Neanderthal with, uh, you know, prosthetic um, face pieces. Uh, but, um, you know, they, they weren't quite sure. It, it didn't, you know, they did this test and decided that maybe it didn't look a hundred percent like what they wanted to do they they advertised in the times for um for people who had short people with long arms i mean that, that actually is an ad that they put in and they held an audition for it and Stuart would tell me about how all these people came in with their knees bent to try and make their arms look longer um and eventually uh, you know they're coming into the question over this is supposed to be the dawn of man where man is becoming uh, more intelligent and starts to think for himself. Um, and it raised questions over clothing. Um, ignore the shoes, they just took him outside, take the photograph. But, um, you know, the question over genitalia and covering that uh, would indicate a consciousness in the, uh, in the, 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 the Neanderthal of nudity that really didn't fit with the story. And so it was decided that they needed to go for something more primitive. And that's how they, you know, they moved on to these uh, ape suits. This movie aired the same year as Planet of the Apes and Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote 2001 A Space Odyssey, um, was actually appalled that, um, that Planet of the Apes won the Oscar for Best Makeup that year and that Stuart's apes, uh, which were much more realistic, uh, didn't. Um, but the truth of the matter is he, he, he indicated that he thought that the reason that they didn't um, that it, this didn't win was because the apes were so realistic that the people at the academy thought they were real. Um, the truth of the matter is that we're talking about a new type of creature suit, something that hadn't been presented uh, apart from um, uh, Charlie Kimura, um doing doing ape suits. Uh, you know, back in the in the thirties, I think um, they they didn't recognize. Um, suits like this as being animatronic, so that, that word didn't even apply, wasn't even applied at the time. Um, they, they didn't recognize it as makeup, and so they determined that they weren't going to give best makeup to it. But uh, the truth is that what Stu was working on there um, was really the beginnings of, uh, of animatronic. Uh, masks. Um, they were made with a with an underskull that was mechanical. Of course, Stu was not alone uh, in this. He had a, a team of people that were working with him. And like when I was head of department, I would uh, I would want to incorporate um, 
the thoughts of, uh, of their team members. Stuart had his own fixed ideas and, and um, was groundbreaking in that, but he was also, I think, smart enough to, uh, to incorporate uh, those other things. Here you can see him sculpting uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the pieces. This is a foam latex skin on a, a, a urethane um, underskull. And it, this particularly, this, this project generated a, a friendship between uh, Stu and the legendary Dick Smith in the States um, uh, because he, they would trade notes on foam latex and making models for foam latex and, and various other things. And one of the amazing shots in um, uh, 2001 is where, you know, you see um, the, the lips of the um, of the ape in close up, you know, pulling back and the tongue coming out and trying to lick flies off a off a piece of meat uh, that uh, you know that it puts in its mouth. Uh, this was realism beyond anything that anyone had had seen at that time, and it put Stuart in his own category. Um, many years later, um, this would be around. Uh, this would be at least ten years uh, later. Um, when I was working at, at, at Stu's house, um, he showed me some of the, the relics that he had. And um, earlier I was talking about wig boxes. You can see here one of the boxes that, um, that he kept those pieces in, these big, heavy-duty cardboard boxes at the side. I started to work with Stuart um, in 1971 on a movie called Young Winston about Winston Churchill um, when he was young. I had been um, stalking him for a couple of years. I'd gotten into the business in 1969, just after um, 2001 A Space Odyssey. And, uh, you know, he was the guy that I knew was going to get, uh, you know, all the real cutting edge um, jobs. And and so you know I stalked him and um, he employed me first of all as a as a straight makeup artist and that's what I was doing on uh, Young Winston largely doing beards beard work for um, for the Houses of Commons and uh, the whirling dervishes for the for the battle scenes um, but I wasn't going to stop there so in uh, 1974 I also worked with Stuart um, on uh, Peter Sellers movie called Soft Beds and Hard Battles, which is one of those movies that people have completely forgotten now. But he really took what he had done in um, Doctor Strangelove to a completely different level and started to do a whole series of different characters on Peter Sellers to you know, change his uh, appearance um, to, to literally play a whole series of um, different characters, which you can see along the way. I remember Peter Sellers lost his teeth one day and uh, that was one of those lessons where you say no one shouts at Peter Sellers for losing his teeth, they would shout at Stuart for not having a second set. So that's why um, what the guys were saying in the last um, in the last panel, there's always backups and second uh, uh, versions. Probably the, um, the most striking of uh, these makeups is this Japanese makeup, uh, which yes that is Peter Sellers underneath all of that. Um, that Stuart had done, and um, and his depiction of Sellers as uh, as Hitler, um, a, a wide range of um, prosthetic uh, character um, effects. So another landmark um, movie, very uh, popular movie, was The Omen. It came out a little after um, The Exorcist. And uh, had some uh, ha had some very realistic uh, dog puppets and other things in there, and, and uh, another effect that I'm going to talk about later on when I get to talk about uh, his son Graham in more detail. So we are now down to 1976. That was when this movie came out, not when it was made. It would have been made in 1975. And in 1976, we started to make the movie that suddenly um, was going to be the movie that everybody remembers to for and forgot about the previous uh, 40 years of his career, Star Wars. Star Wars, um, of course, the, the, the main creature effect in that was Chewbacca. And Stuart's main focus uh, when we were making those movies was the, the Chewbacca mask and the Chewbacca suit. Um, but of course, he was involved in, as head of department in, um, in all the creatures from the Moss Eisley Cantina. Um, but those weren't things that he sculpted. Those were things that were, that were done under his supervision by um, members of the team. Um, Chewbacca was, you know, uh, based very directly on the technology that he had used 
in uh, 2001 for Space Odyssey. I mean, every time you do a new job, you try to improve what you did before, and so it gets a bit more sophisticated. Um, but he had the same uh, concept of, uh, you know, a tongue that could uh, come out and move around and the lips uh, that smiled. What, what was really relevant about 2001 and uh, Chewbacca was that these characters had no cables. I mean, often we see... Uh, characters in different movies, especially in the States, uh, which have uh, you know, a lot of facial movement, um, but they're being operated largely by puppeteers and operators that are, uh, that are just out of shot. Um, in this case, Stuart had a, a, a very different um, aim at it. He wanted everything to be operated literally by the actor. And so the, um, the, the movement in the lips and the movement in the tongue is all generated mechanically from the movements of, um, of, of Peter, who was uh, inside the suit, you can see they, they you know, we, there was more than one um, Chewbacca suit that was made. Um, the the first one to get filming, but at, in case something happened, Stu was making a second one, and that second um, that second uh, mask uh, was later on changed into Mrs. Chewie for the holiday special, and. That's uh, an, another interesting story because Stu never really forgave Lucasfilm for um, taking that backup mask and giving it to Stan Winston for him to um, change into Mrs. Chewie for the holiday special. To my knowledge, up until that time, Stan Winston, who later on became the world leader in animatronics um, and, and uh, you know, particularly um, puppets uh, with... with um, I think Park and uh, and some of those others. He was a very talented makeup artist at that time who was doing uh, gelatine prosthetics and various other things. But to my knowledge, he he wasn't hadn't been doing anything that was uh, mechanical that I have seen any record of. And so Stu was upset that this uh, these techniques that he was using that he considered to be proprietary had been taken by Lucasfilm and shared with someone that he saw as a competitor. Um, Stu was a very competitive. Um, guy, um, and, and that might come up uh, a little more later on. So here you can see uh, the Chewbacca suit in its various versions. Uh, this is Kay, who was uh, Stu's um, wife. Uh, she was really basically um, looking after makeup on on the set on most of these, and then she would look after Chewbacca on the set too. Um, but it was uh, at this point in time when I joined the movie. Uh, Graham, his son, was the one that was doing all the phone runs in this little tiny room that we were in. Um, and this was the movie where I learned um, how to make these these phone pieces and where I learned uh, this. And I have, I have to say that the whole of my career really was based around the things that, the thoughts, processes that Stuart inspired in me um, as a rather reluctant mentor, I suspect. Um, and, and in the... Uh, in the techniques that I that I learnt um, from these early Star Wars movies, you can uh, see me here uh, with creatures from Mos Eisley. Uh, the person standing next to me with the tie is Graham. That's uh, and he was he. he you're going to learn he was very uh, influential in helping me get started on that movie, um, and uh, you know I owe him a lot as well. After Star Wars, we went on to do a movie for. Uh, Gene Roddenberry. Um, this was probably the worst movie that uh, Gene Roddenberry ever made. Roddenberry ever made. Um, I, I didn't see it for many, many years, but it, um, it, it it's not something that um, I think was very well um, put together. Uh, you can see the the, the um, one of the, the the villain demons uh, in this, and and one of our last guests, Brandon, I believe, sold this through the prop store um, some years later. But it involved a lot of um, a lot of, of creatures that we uh, that we made at Stu's um, flats. Uh, here you can see me working with Stu taking a life cast. Um, I'm not sure which movie that's from, but I suspect it's from Superman. Uh, Superman's work, uh, Stu's work on Superman, is largely overlooked. Um, it, it, you know, people uh, people would see the things that we made for that and. And just take it as being something that was realistic, and, um, and and say to me, "But what makeup effects are there in Superman?" Well, this says you'll believe a man can fly, but you, uh, but actually, um, Chris couldn't. 
And, um, you know, so there were various things that had to be done to, uh, to create that. We, we worked, I worked with Stu on the first Superman movie and on Superman 2, uh, or at least on the first half of Superman 2. Uh, by the time they went back to Superman 2 to finish it, I was already m moving on and, and doing other things. We made for that movie um, 160 different dummies, different sizes to do different shots. And uh, this one that you see on the right here um, was for an optical effect where the, um, where the, the sculpted um, Superman was covered in 3M beads and um, light was bounced off of uh, a sheet of glass in front of the camera. Uh, that then you know picked up that so by by basically there's a sequence where uh, Superman is absorbing the power of an atomic bomb and uh, you know he's spinning and he starts to glow as he absorbs the energy. This is all done in camera and so the light um, was brought it was a red light and it was brought up um, on the figure as it was spinning and so that it glowed redder and redder and redder uh, and for that I believe Stu got a credit. For, for visual effects. On that movie, I was basically doing makeup on uh, the two supervillains and spending the rest of my time, I'd get them ready in the mornings. Um, I wouldn't always do that makeup, it would depend on what other things were being done, but um, I, I would do um, these guys and then go up and be working on uh, all of those dummies uh, that we were making for flying sequences and other things. But we also built cats to be rescued from trees. Uh, we also, uh, I was closely involved in this polar bear. I, I applied all the fur uh, to that, um, which was uh, laid on. This is actually goat skin. Um, and this was something for uh, the ice fortress where polar bear is swimming through the, um, through the ice flow. Um, you can see some of the uh, hundreds of uh, dummies that we made. Um, these characters in the background here, this is a little boy that went over Niagara Falls. And we made lots of them because we didn't know whether um, he'd go over Niagara Falls right the first time or whether we'd have to keep on putting more dummies. You know, they don't like it if you put a 12-year-old boy in a canoe and push him over Niagara Falls. It's, it's not something that uh, we could actually do at the time. Here you can see one of those flying rigs. I'm not quite sure which of the Superman movies this is from, but I believe it's from the, uh, the, the second one where uh, Lois Lane is taken uh, to fly. Um, and, uh, you know, these are relatively primitive in comparison, uh, you know, hand-operated flying rig in comparison with some of the hydraulics and things that uh, the people would do uh, today. So after Superman, we went on to that second um, Star Wars movie, Empire Strikes Back. And uh, you can see um, some of the crew that were involved in that. Now, uh, you know, the people, Stu didn't really want to have a big crew of people that he was teaching all his tricks to, which is why I said that in some ways he was kind of a reluctant um, mentor but you know just being around this guy who thought so differently to everybody else was an inspiration in itself and and inspired us all um you know to think uh, differently uh, we had uh, you've got graham uh, on the on the left um bob keen who went on he was this was uh, you know his first uh, makeup effects job bob went became my assistant for five years and went on to uh, to hellraiser and eventually directed nine movies of his own uh, Stuart, Barbara, who was the chief hairdresser, uh, myself, um, and uh, um, Pat, who was Barbara's uh, assistant, and Dave Barkley, who was another trainee. Uh, the only person who's not in this photograph, because it presumably was before he joined us, is Nick Dudman. Uh, and that was, our, that was our crew. We were building uh, the Ugnaughts, we were building the Wampa, the Tonton, um, the Minak, uh, and of course, the world's first animatronic superstar, Yoda. And that is where um, Stu, again, had these ideas of taking the animatronic effects that um, now seem quite primitive in Chewbacca to a completely different level into a glove puppet. And he was never going to give in to a challenge. There were, there were designs that were done for Yoda, which obviously uh, Stu, like myself, I, you know, we don't really want to create someone else's design. Uh, although that's very common these days, um, we, you know, we wanted to create our own characters. And so um, Stuart sculpted up this design that was, uh, you know, quite close to 
the drawings, but it really didn't look very friendly, and it really didn't look um, it really didn't look uh, particularly wise. And so they messed around for a long, long time trying to decide uh, what Yoda was going to look like. And uh, too much time was spent on the design period and didn't leave enough time for the mechanics of of you know an animatronic character. You know the guys have been talking here about um, uh, about Dark Crystal and how you know animatronics you know really um, exploded um, with that. But Yoda was a, a couple of years before that. He he was the first animatronic character um, that was a puppet character to come to screen, and everyone was very worried about whether or not he, he would be considered. Uh, believable. Uh, Stu eventually came down to within the last two weeks of the sculpting. Um, he changed it to the character uh, that you know, which was much more his design, influenced by a sculpt that had been done by Wendy Minner from the Muppets who had come and joined us. Uh, and if you see my my talk about um, the evolution of Yoda, I go into all of that in much more detail. Ultimately, in the final analysis, uh, Yoda ended up looking so much like Yoda that we, uh, so much like the character that we couldn't really understand why we hadn't just painted him green and stuck the ears on. But uh, this publicity photo really kind of emphasizes that. Very early days of animatronics. You know, Stu uh, was doing um, stuff that was quite heavily engineered, and yet the kind of drawings that he would do would not be. Uh, um, very sophisticated by any measure. And there were a number of different drawings for different ideas on making an eye mechanism um, an eye mechanism work. This one is a solenoid um, eye mechanism, which is an interesting idea, but uh, to my knowledge, Stu never uh, actually built that. I never saw it through. At the same time, we were uh, making the Wampa. Uh, Stu, if I remember correctly, sculpted the, uh, the head of the Wampa. Um, and his son Graham and I were closely involved in um, in building the Wampa suit. It was Stu's design to have uh, you know a, a an almost seven foot guy in a ten foot uh, costume, but um, but he wasn't kind of directly um, involved in in doing that. A head of department has too many things to try and stay on top of to literally physically do everything themselves. Uh, later on, of course, Stu went on to do Return of the Jedi, and by that time, um, I was doing uh, other movies. Um, he uh, he was the one who masterminded the uh, Ewoks. Um, he uh, oversaw uh, the, the making uh, fabrication of um, Jabba as uh, head of department. But by this time, something had happened um, that uh, was really caused largely by Stu's uh, unwillingness to expand the team. He really didn't want, as I said, to train a lot of people that would be competition to him later on down the line. So you know, when we were making Yoda, he, he kept on saying, oh no, we don't have enough people to, to do this and we don't have enough people to do that. And the result was the expansion of the ILM uh, team in California and the, um, the making of a lot of maquettes uh, between uh, these movies that ultimately um, led to Phil Tippett being much more involved in the live action creature effects. Uh, obviously, the Emperor's makeup, which was done by Nick Dubman, um, you know, was under his domain as well. And you know, he rebuilt Yoda for uh, you know Yoda's death. Um, uh, that puppet was was a rework of the um, of the prototype that he built for Empire Strikes Back. It got a Saturn Award for. Um, the creatures in uh, this movie. And this is the photo of Stu um, with Phil Tippett. But if you really look closely at Stu's expression, you'll see that he was not thrilled about sharing um, these uh, creature effects. It was, not, um, it was not a way that he wanted to go. Um, there was a number of uh, photos that circulated. I, I actually think um, not the photo on the right, but I think the photo on the left is actually photos that I may have taken when I saw him in uh, 1998 um, when uh, he was making a figure for the Museum of the Moving Image. And uh, a lot of the time this will be shown as, uh, or it'll be taken as, you know, the under structure of uh, the, the Yodas that were filmed. This actually has nothing to do uh, with that and the body shape and the, the molding 
of that has um, is not is not the same at all. The bodies for filming were made entirely differently to that. I uh, I was talking about this a little earlier. I I met up with Stu again in '98 and uh, took this photograph of the um, of the bust for Yoda for Episode One and one of the skins that we'd made uh, 20 years earlier. And this was. Uh, really, to show the, the difference uh, between the two. Ultimately, the the Yoda from Episode One, the puppet that they built, was uh, covered with a with an animation for the Blu-ray. Stu has largely been, you know, remembered uh, from his retirement. He had a lot of stuff in his attic. You can see Chris Reeves and Peter Sellers and and Gene Hackman and uh, Gregory Peck. These these life casts that. Um, that he just had tucked away in the attic of his house. Uh, ultimately, um, the, the, when I when I met up with him, I, I had someone take a, a photo of us together, and uh, I, I, I digitally, you know, made him green in this because he had for us, he as our mentor really was our Yoda, the guy who knew it all and. Um, shook his head from time to time as he looked at the experimental things that we were working at. Um, he lived to be uh, in his late uh, 90s and um, used to really enjoy telling stories about his, about his career. Um, when he finally died, um, all his sons had actually died before him. And um, there was a sadness in that because he had really given birth to a, a legacy of freeborns who'd become very influential um, through movies uh, in the uh, you know in the in the seventies and the eighties uh, going into the nineties. And I want to talk in detail about his son Graham, um, who is absolutely an unsung hero of the classic Star Wars trilogy. Um, Graham, I don't know his exact birthday. I know he, he would have been born in the late forties. He died uh, in 1986, so he died very young. He was a, 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 a real character, a very humorous uh, guy. Um, we basically um, became friends um, on that first movie that I made, but I'm going I'm to get to that. You can see publicity photo here of Graham and uh, Stu and Kay. Um, that was done, uh, I believe, uh, during Empire Strikes Back, which is why one of the Yoda skins that I've made is in that shot. Um, but Graham's first movie was on 2001 A Space Odyssey, which he didn't get a credit for. Um, but uh, it was a young Winston in 1971 um, that uh, he and I became friends on because I was taken on for two days on that job while Stuart decided whether I was worth employing or not. And I worked on it for 16 weeks and we went out on location to Morocco. And during that time, we kind of bonded. You know, you go out on location and you're hanging out in the, in the bar at the end of the day. Um, he, he was a, a more generous spirit than uh, some people. So me, as that young guy who was trying too hard to impress people and trying too hard to be likable, um, he kind of looked past that and, and um, became a friend. And we used to sit and play backgammon and, and various things after work. The thing that was really very influential in my career, uh, something that I um, never forgot, uh, was... Graham's uh, influence on getting me into um, creature effects. So, you know, this is 1971 when we became friends. Uh, I believe it was around about 1973 when Graham uh, started to do um, a series of ads uh, with Donald Pleasance for Holston uh, Pills Lager. Uh, Holston Pills became well known for humorous um, TV ads and but um, it was all done on a budget, so there wasn't any any way that we could have a big crew for that. And the creatures were were actually all made in Graham's house. Uh, you know, we uh, we we made Frankenstein. Uh, we made uh, the the werewolf, and uh, and we made uh, the mummy, and we made uh, Quasimodo. And it was really my time helping Graham do that. That was the beginning footing of me getting involved in prosthetics and um, here is one of those one of those commercials this is my favorite bar it's a bit odd but so is my favorite bar it's fruit and all the sugar turns into alcohol clearly 
still taking the pills. I said, pills? They want blood. I feel wholesome. You know, after that, um, they were making a movie, The Omen, and there's a beheading sequence in that. So if you're squeamish, you don't want to watch this particular clip. Graham was the guy who was uh, who was making this head that uh, comes off in this sequence. If you don't do it, I will. I'm really just trying to show you the influence that Graham had over all these movies that Stuart worked on because um, Graham and Stuart were like chalk and cheese. Uh, Stuart would be the guy who was very meticulous and wanted to plan things out and do things in a, in a very precise way. Graham was the guy who would jump in and say, yeah, I can do that. And then he would get it done in a fraction of the time, not necessarily to the same quality, but when the camera turned over, um, nobody really got to see the difference. Um, Graham went on uh, around that time to do um, The Legend of the Werewolf with um, Peter Cushing. And I helped him on that uh, for, for a little while. Um, there, the things that we've done in that uh, Pills Lager ad, um, you know, obviously were quite useful as, uh, you know, we went on to make a, a less comedic version of um, The Werewolf. And, um, and then along came this little movie called The Star Wars. Um, and it was really only because uh, Graham uh, said to Stuart that I had worked with him on that series of little lager ads that uh, Stu agreed to let me join the team. And so it, for that, I, I've always been um, eternally grateful. Graham was so influential on this movie. And yet he didn't even get a credit. Remember what I said about Stu early on? He worked for 10 years and never got a credit. Well, even his own son didn't get a credit um, on, on this movie. And he, he sculpted pretty much everything that you see in this photograph. He also worked on, you know, doing finishing and assembly. Stu was very cautious about the publicity photos. And so there was never any of the rest of the crew in the uh, in any of the photos. I was uh, doing the foam latex work for the movie and made that uh, tussled mohawk that uh, you see Graham applying there and the warts that went onto uh, Greedo. Uh, everything you see in these photographs was sculpted by Graham. While Stu was working on Chewbacca, Graham was the one running around. Most of these characters were sculpted in a day, at the very most, a day and a half. And they would sit there waiting. Uh, the, the hand that gets cut off that you see here, that was Graham's work too. Um, Graham was the guy who made, you know, the weird space girl. You see him applying the, the bald head here. And um, I would never have been, you know, in this crew. And my career would never have taken off probably if it hadn't been for Graham's work uh, that was so influential through this series of movies. Yet he is almost never talked about. Later on, I was asked to do a album cover for a British rocker called uh, Graham Parker. Yeah, and you know, just as Gra Graham had, had used me in, um, in making the, the Pills Lager ad, um, I involved him in this as well. So I, we weren't sure what, how, what extent they would want uh, this makeup. So we made three different um, variations. Graham sculpted the, the one on the right, which is actually, this is a makeup that I completed on Bob Keane when we were locking around one Sunday. But um, this is uh, the one that I sculpted, which, um, which actually eventually made it to the, to the album cover. Um, Graham was going off uh, being, uh, you know, head of department and uh, other movies. Here, you'll see him 1978 in Game of Death, which was a Bruce Lee movie. I remember him flying off to, uh, to do that too, wondering what, uh, you know, what he was up to there. Um, and then we came back. Two, of course, we did Superman. Uh, on Superman, uh, he was basically um, uh, making dummies, and then he was one of the main makeup artists. Uh, and then we came back to Empire Strikes Back. So he was the makeup artist. Uh, he and I uh, built the, the ten foot tall Wampa body, and he was the one that was looking after the Wampa out when they when they rather foolishly took it 
to Norway to walk on the, on a field. You know, this character was designed to walk on salt in the soundstage. If you've got a guy who's seven foot tall standing on stilts, you know, the figure is 10 foot tall, and lo and behold, they take him to Norway and expect him to walk on ice. But, you know, that wasn't... Uh, that wasn't a, a, a good plan. Here, I think this is actually uh, reworks from Return of the Jedi. Uh, should have been in a different uh, section where often these masks would get uh, reused. This was a version of the Wampa with these huge, almost fly-like eyes, which I made, um, which doesn't have the horns and um, was an early kind of prototype idea that, that ultimately uh, wasn't used. But, you know, Graham's a guy who made up the Ugnaughts because I made the foam pieces for them. Here you'll see uh, the team that we talked about from Empire uh, Strikes Back. And right after that movie, uh, Graham and I had, you know, we'd really built a, a solid bond. The, the second assistant director on that movie, um, Harley Coakless, um, was um, supposedly going to go on to direct a Ray Harryhausen movie called Thongor and the Valley of Demons. And Graham and I went on to be the heads of the department on that. Um, the, you'll see here the Harry Housen sculpt, and this is the close-up puppet head that I sculpted uh, for that. But unfortunately, the money folded on that. So that was our first effort to collaborate, just the two of us, to, uh, to, you know, to make a motion picture. It didn't work out, but we worked on it, I think, for five or six weeks uh, before it folded. Graham went on to be the head makeup artist on Dragon Slayer. And of course, by the time he got to Star Wars episode, uh, six, he got a credit as the chief makeup artist. Um, here you can see Dragon Slayer 1981 uh, and, of course, uh, Return of the Jedi. On Return of the Jedi, I know he was involved in uh, all the Ewoks as well as doing um, all the straight makeups on, uh, on the actors uh, you know, that were there. It wasn't a long time after that that he was diagnosed uh, with skin cancer. He, he used to really love the sun, and he had a, a, a sun lamp at home uh, that he used a lot. And uh, you know, I really blame that sun lamp that it killed him far, far too early. During the, the time that he was sick and being treated, I would use him at every chance that I had on the movies that I was now making as head of department. And he was very instrumental in the charred bodies that we did for this scene of uh, almost a battalion of um, of Nazi soldiers that had been uh, that had been killed by this malevolent uh, spirit. He and I were close friends. By this time, I was working such long hours, I used to cut my hair between movies. You can see I'm maybe a little heavier than two, but we were the closest to pals. And and you know, I had wanted um, to form a company with Stu and him and me. Uh, being able to do a series of different movies all at the same time. Um, Graham helped me with this Humpty Dumpty Kinder Surprise ad uh, that I did. He helped me doing the life casts for these dummies that we built for uh, Life Force. He was really the, the guy uh, who, who was in charge of the life casting um, on that movie. And ultimately, uh, he helped me on uh, Highlander as well. After I went off to the Caribbean, he assisted on a couple of other movies, but it was only a year after that that uh, he finally succumbed to cancer and died. And I wanted to make sure that in this series of, um, of broadcasts that Graham you know, got the, the full due for his contributions to Star Wars that, um, that formerly um, he, he never got. He was a great artist. Um, a very quick artist and no nonsense guy, uh, and I and I loved him dearly. Uh, I miss him, you know, uh, all the way to today. So uh, that was uh, one of the panels that I did a, a while back um, when we were doing uh, our live panels for our um, for our patrons. These are people who subscribe to us on Patreon and, and give us $5 a month or, or more, whatever they want. Um, and they get to see all of these panels live. We've got another live panel coming up in uh, seven days. And that's going to be the first horror um, 
broadcast that we do. I'm going to be talking um, a lot about the work that we did on Life Force, which is a cult horror movie now where we completely destroyed London and had um, all live in camera uh, transformation effects. Um, we're also going to have uh, people about building costumes and sets for haunted houses and Halloween. And uh, and also we're going to have some other uh, makeup experts talking about doing zombie makeups and uh, scars and wounds. So, you know, if you like that kind of thing, you should definitely uh, not miss it. It'll be premiering at uh, 11 o'clock next Sunday in our... Uh, Folio Star Foundation uh, donors group. Um, it won't be for everyone to watch because uh, that you know our, our patrons have to have something special for the fact that they are our patrons. Um, but um, later on, we'll be breaking those down into individual panels like the one you just watched, and we'll be broadcasting them here, so you'll get to see them eventually uh, anyway. Of course, it's always better to be a patron because you can ask questions for the panelists um, who can answer them live. Well, thank you for watching. I hope you had a good time. I hope uh, you'll leave some uh, messages. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to uh, answer your questions once I have um, shut down this broadcast. So let me just take a, uh, a quick look here and we'll see uh, if there is uh, any other comments that I haven't uh, responded to. Alexander, is, you know, you're asking me for a lot of details that really uh, I, I can't give you about how to build Yoda and how to build Chewbacca. I can't give you a whole list of photographs that we took while we were making him because we weren't allowed to take photographs in those days. It's only in uh, the process of rebuilding Yoda that I've managed to take, uh, you know, much more photographs that, that that have gone with that. And to be honest, even with the series of photos, uh, building an animatronic puppet and the principles that are involved within that it, it, in detail is a very complicated issue. You need to study with someone who uh, who is a, a creature effects builder. You need to do an apprenticeship. And we're talking, uh, you know, a couple of years. We're not talking about stuff that you can just, you know, read a page and say, Sit down and do it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to tell you that, but you know that's the truth of it. Anything that's worth doing, you know, it takes time. You can't produce an amazing effect without making an amazing effort. Um, those are things from my, you know, from my little book of big ideas. I'm trying to see if there were any other um, questions here that I can respond directly to. Uh, Alejandro, um, uh, yes, I'm happy to do an interview um, for uh, for your group. You should. Um, you're on. Uh, you're viewing this on YouTube. So um, if you go to Facebook, uh, you should be able to. Um, you know, put in Nick Maley or um, Yoda Guy, you'll find me on Facebook. Just PM me and, uh, and we'll organize that. If that's a problem, then yeah, leave, a, leave another message uh, after this and I'll try to get my email to you. But, you know, obviously I don't broadcast that uh, to everybody on, on YouTube. I got 16,000 followers there. So um, I think that's about it for today. Um, I thank you all for watching and for being attentive and for staying with me um, for, the, for the whole of this. Uh, and I will see you again maybe next week or uh, when I'm broadcasting something else that's of interest to you. So Nick Maley, Yoda Guy Movie Exhibit, signing out. And um, may the force be with you.